feels a little weird to review a game that came out in 2013 on the PS3, and was already remastered on the PS4 to bring its amazing story and gameplay into the modern era with graphical buffs. While the question, should this game exist, has some ground to stand on, as I played through one of my favorite story-driven action-adventure games at a buttery smooth 60 frames per second, with the DualSense controller doing tricks in my hand, and the Tempest audio engine immersing me in my environment, it became clear, for me, this was $70 well spent. Ah yes, the old Grand Theft Auto and Skyrim report, remaster, and re-release trick, this time from Naughty Dog, with a full remake, not a remaster. Should you embark on this new journey with Joel and Ellie? Let's find out. You can download the standard or digital deluxe versions on the PlayStation Network, and it is a hefty $70 for the standard edition, which is what I purchased, and then for an additional $10, there's the digital deluxe edition, which comes with some in-game goodies, so these are perks I'd rather unlock organically by playing the game and save my $10. Now, if you're in North America, you can get the Firefly edition directly from PlayStation through PlayStation Direct, and this is a $100 collector's bundle. However, unfortunately, I have been hearing that there are reports a lot of these are being delivered damaged, and since these are a limited run, Sony is actually not reimbursing or sending out a replacement, which is insane. So in my opinion, the smart play is simply to stick to the standard edition on PS5. I'm proud to report to you that the story has remained unscathed completely. They didn't change the story at all. They did change some of the character models visually, which we're going to talk about because I think it's for the better, despite it receiving a little bit of criticism. But luckily, the story has remained unchanged, which is fantastic because the story is an absolute masterpiece. But if you want me to oversimplify what is one of the best stories in gaming, I'll do it. Airborne fungal virus outbreaks. Chill laid back dude from Texas loses his daughter. Several years later, he's given a chance to be a father again by taking a young girl on a cross country road trip, bonding along the way. And as the player, you get to enjoy some of the best character development and witty banter between Joel and Ellie on their road trip. Warning, Warning. heavy spoilers, spoilers incoming. incoming. Although if you haven't played it by now, you're late because it's nine years old and came out on the PS3. If you haven't been spoiled by now, good on you for being completely off the grid. Anyway, spoiler city, population you, I'm about to explain the entire story. But this young lady is bitten, and has been, and isn't turning, showing that she is the key to making a vaccine, reversing the course of the world back to normal. So you're taking this young girl on a cross-country trip to get to an organization called the Fireflies, which has the doctors, medicine, technology needed to extract a vaccine out of this girl. Unfortunately, we do find out that the process of extracting a vaccine out of her will kill her, because the fungus, the infection, grows on the brain. There's, there, there's no way to extract a sample of that without killing her, right? And Joel is thinking at his core, this is my chance to have a baby girl again. And, uh, you know, I feel like a Paul again. And Joel stops the procedure, killing a doctor and leader of the Fireflies in the process and gets Ellie out of there. Roll in credits. You just beat Last of Us 1 in probably about 16 to 20 hours. Again, that is a savage oversimplification of what is some of the best writing that I have experienced. It's funny, the only other series I would put on par with The Last of Us is actually Uncharted, which is another Naughty Dog title, so it seems like Naughty Dog is fantastic when it comes to making cinematic, movie-like experiences that you play through. So as for gameplay, things like movement around the environment, climbing, traversal, side quests, puzzles, crafting, your inventory system, your skill tree, unique activities, so little mini games that Joel and Ellie play. So the things that you actually do in the game minus combat or fighting, because that has its own section. It feels like a game from 2013. They didn't add the prone mechanics of Last of Us 2. Also, you can't free jump to anything in the environment, so you'll see a lot of things that you want to jump to that you simply can't. There's predetermined objects in the environment that you will get a prompt to jump to, which was a complaint that I also mentioned during my review of Stray, the cat game, that it takes you out of the immersion that you are very limited or reminded that this is a video game because there are invisible walls and things that you simply can't jump to. I love the crafting system because it is so simplistic. You've got six craftable items and six ingredients to make them. It happens in real time, so you don't pop into a sub menu, meaning you can craft in combat, so you push off from an enemy and quickly craft the item that you need in order to fit the situation. And it's simple enough to understand, but complex enough to where I'll have you doing things like crafting items that you might not necessarily want, just so you can free up space for more ingredients in your backpack. The skill tree is also incredibly basic. You basically pop prescription pills to unlock abilities. The ones that I recommend prioritizing would be weapons 
anyway and maximum health everything else is just whatever at your leisure because me personally crafting speed doesn't matter because i do almost all my crafting outside of combat listen speed i'm not much of a stealth player i like to run and gun a lot although i do stealth a little bit too as you're seeing from some of the b-roll that's just the way i run the skill tree but because of the limited character movement the fact i wish they had more mini games that joel and ellie could bond over have some good dialogue and also you the character could break up the monotony of shooting looting and climbing by maybe doing a little mini game like having a snowball fight with ellie well they did that in the last of us too but they could have done it here just some fun things running around with ellie but the gameplay works it's solid but doesn't really innovate and does feel like an older title i'm giving it three out of five right there in the middle now as for combat this is a bit of a mixed sack they took a lot of the goodies from the last of us 2 game engine such as enemy ai being a lot better they'll now work together to flank you enemy ai is much better also your companion ai is quite a bit better to where when you are crouched in stealth mode they will actually try and also be in stealth and avoid being seen i did run into a couple moments where my companion so usually ellie was clear as day seen she would run right out in front of an enemy and they wouldn't see her which takes you out of the immersion and reminds you you are playing a video game the best way for me to describe the combat or fighting or shooting of this game is the fact that it is serviceable it works you can kill enemies to get through the game and it is fun the the guns have a nice satisfying pop or snap, and you feel that thunk in the DualSense haptic feedback, along with some awesome audio design for all of the guns, but they didn't add a lot of features that I wish they would have transferred over from Last of Us 2, such as the prone feature. Granted, I understand Naughty Dog probably didn't want to take the time and energy to edit the existing maps or game world to make use of the prone feature, where you can crawl underneath cars like you did in Last of Us 2. I'm totally fine with them not including the prone feature, because like I said, they'd have to revamp all the maps. I really wish they would have included the quick dodge where you tap the crouch or evade button and you'll quickly dodge it can help you to get out of the zombie grab range in a pinch and quickly back away from enemies to gather your composure and figure out your next move and you don't have that here which really comes into play when you're fighting the bloaters because they charge you and if they actually touch you it's a one hit kill so it even says in the loading menu and it gives you game hints or tips to run sideways to avoid their attack so you actually have to hold down the sprint which is bound to l1 by default and then run back and forth in a ziggity zaggy pattern to not get grabbed as opposed to just being able to flick the left stick and tap the dodge button to roll or jump out of the way you actually have to turn your character and then run back and forth that's when it kind of reminds you like hey this is a this is a game from 2013 i did notice that the human enemies had substantially better ai and would work together to flank you one thing i wish they would have transferred over from last of us 2 it's such a simple thing but made such a big difference was the fact that all the enemies you kill have a name so they would refer to each other by name which gave you a little bit more of that human factor and made you feel a little some type of way about killing people that had names. They kept it true to the original, which is a good and bad thing. I'm going to go ahead and give combat a three out of five. It is serviceable, but it feels like an older title. The inclusion of that quick dodge button would have gotten it a whole extra point, making it a four out of five. And the inclusion of dead zone settings for controller thumbsticks and aim assist that didn't feel too intrusive or non-existent might have landed combat at a five out of five. But overall, it's not bad. It's just not great either. Graphics. This is simply put one of the most beautiful games that I have played. A lot of this comes down to lighting, and you definitely notice that in the side-by-side -side comparisons of the 2013 PlayStation 3 release, as well as the 2014 PS4 remaster. The PS5 remake absolutely blows them out of the water, because neither of those older consoles have the graphical horsepower to push indirect lighting like the PS5 does. All of the lighting cascades or bleeds over the environments in a very natural manner, to where you never think to yourself, mm, that lamp wouldn't be illuminating his face on that side. Everything just looked natural and organic. Now, they did change a few of the character models, most notably Tess, and I think it is a fantastic decision. They made Tess look and feel how she should have in the original game. Notice I didn't say sound because they used the same audio clips, granted they did, clear them up or make them sound better, remaster them if you will, but it's the same audio clips from the same voice actress. But instead of having Tess look like a clean-cut, well-groomed 20-year-old, she looks like a haggard 40-year-old that's actually been running and gunning as a smuggler with Joel for the last 20 years. It makes way more sense. They made her look a little bit more haggard, like she's actually in a post-apocalyptic world, not like she just got out of a bubble bath. I think they made a fantastic choice there. Also, they made Joel look older. He's got a little salt and pep on the sides. They also fully changed the character model for Bill, which I think was for the better. And the biggest thing I can say for all of the character models that were changed, which is a lot of them, from Ellie to Bill to Joel to a lot of the random NPCs and damn near every enemy that you're going to encounter. Their facial animations look a lot more realistic. For example, when you're choking out an enemy with a stealth kill, if you pan the camera around, you see a very realistic, disturbing facial animation as it looks like they're being suffocated, which is something that
something that we saw in Last of Us 2, not in the original Last of Us 1. And we now have that here. So Neil Druckmann and the Naughty Dog team took a lot of the graphical niceties as well as awesome accessibility features that we had in Last of Us 2 and then integrated that with the story of Last of Us 1. Graphics leading the forefront of that. They are an absolute 5 out of 5. Can't say enough about them. The graphics are amazing. You know what else is amazing? audio design, which is good because your eyeballs, they do a lot for you, but the ear canals, they do good things as well. This is actually the first game I've ever played, or at least that I can recall off memory, where you actually feel like you're being shot at when you're in gunfights. And that comes down to a combination of awesome audio design, where bullets ricochet, whistle, and whip past your head, in combination with the DualSense providing feedback for every shot, reload, and melee strike. If you play this game at a decent volume, especially with something like a soundbar, surround sound, or a decent headset, you're going to be flinching when you're getting shot at because... It feels pretty real. I played the game out of a Dolby Atmos soundbar with a subwoofer and two rear satellite speakers. I set the dynamic spread to medium and left all the other audio settings default, and it sounded amazing. Very good situational awareness, stereo spread. You can pinpoint where enemies are, not only left and right, but also above and below, which is awesome. Granted, there's not a lot of verticality in the maps in comparison to Last of Us 2. Another reason that combat only got a three out of five. But what I noticed most about the audio design was actually the ambient sounds. So the environment, nature sounds often the distance, and you really notice this because the soundtrack doesn't really provide music very often. Music only fades in during cinematic cutscenes or during very select moments where it's going to add to the emotion. For the most part, you are listening to nothing but the pitter-patter of your footsteps on soil or snow or rock, wind rustling through the trees, birds chirping, and the occasional zombie moaning off in the distance. It's amazing and really immerses you in the environment. I love it. Audio design, five out of five, just like graphics. It's good. It's real good. As with a lot of the sound effects or audio design of the game, the soundtrack was also kept the same. Granted, they did enhance it or remaster it, but it is the exact same soundtrack. It fades in at the same moments. And like I mentioned in the previous section, what I noticed most about this particular soundtrack is its very selective placement because you don't get music very often, but when you do, it's just right. I'm giving soundtrack five out of five. It's iconic. If you want to download it, the composer is Gustavo Santiolala. I Miss, mess that one up. Ayo alala. Ayo alala. God damn it. Right there. That's the one. The settings are so robust that I'm about to bust as well. One of the biggest additions to this remake is going to be the settings, specifically accessibility that are going to let this game be playable by a lot more gamers that might have a specific impairment. One of the ones that I used frequently in my playthrough was this low visibility mode, which highlights friendly players in blue, enemies in red, and most importantly to me, items in the environment in yellow. While you could leave this on during combat sequences to highlight enemies, that's not what I used it for. I would search a room as normally for items and loot, but before I left, I'd take another glance at the room with that low visibility mode on, and lo and behold, most of the time, I left a couple of drawers unturned. Is it cheating? Um, eh, perhaps. Is it also a single player mode that I'm not hurting anybody because it's offline? It's not multiplayer? That, that as well. Get off my case, bud. Now, you do have full button mapping, and you can create three custom profiles and swap them on the fly. Kind of on the fly. It's still have to enter the settings menu. It's not like you can set it to a button or anything like that. These are my personal aiming settings. I'm a 7-7 seven, seven and a 6 6 when I'm aiming down sights. I like to lose a little bit of that sensitivity for those finite movements. I also turned ramp power scale or RPS to 10. By default, it is at zero. And this works as acceleration to where your inputs are instantly recognized and don't have a little virtual ramp up, which I don't like because it feels laggy to me. I find this feature gimmicky, but I have heard a lot of my community say that they personally love motion sensor aiming on like the Valve Steam Deck and controllers. You can turn it on here, which is pretty cool. You can actually aim on screen with the gyroscope motion sensing. And then you have your aim assist at the bottom, which I did tinker with. I did notice at its lower values, it felt like it was doing nothing. And at its default of 10, it was actually just right. There was only a couple of occasions where I actually noticed it feather over an enemy character model. For the most part, it was so subtle that I didn't even notice it, which I like. If you're just playing the game for its story and you don't really want the challenge of shooting or combat, you can turn lock on aiming on to where basically you just hold down the left trigger and you'll snap onto the closest enemy and then you can clap his cheeks, snap onto the next enemy, touch him in the nether regions, move on to the next enemy, Dutch rudder, move on, Portuguese bow tie, so on and so forth. Me personally, I actually like to take credit for clapping the cheeks myself by being the one that actually aimed and pulled the trigger. I'm not going to go over each individual setting because we would be here until the cows come home. I don't know who's got the cows. I sure as hell don't have a pasture in my backyard, but as the saying goes, until the cows come home, but as you can see, there is a virtual shit ton of settings. Everything from changing subtitle colors 
in size to six graphical modes, which we touched on earlier. So my preference for graphical settings, performance mode, unlocked frame rate on. If you don't have the option, still target performance mode. Motion blur, just turn it off. There's no reason for it in any title. Camera shake, it's somewhat cinematic. And since it's not a competitive multiplayer game, it's not really taking away from anything. Film grain, same category as the motion blur. File it in the trash. And gore, just leave it on default. What is this? The Boy Scouts amateur hour? You can toggle it over here to reduce mode if you don't want to see giblets popping off and whatnot. Another dope accessibility feature. If you're missing a hand, you can literally play this game one-handed. As for the functionality of the DualSense controller, it is simply amazing. As this is a first-party SIE Sony Interactive Entertainment title, they're going to put a hell of a lot of work to make sure that that DualSense controller is really pushing the selling features. The adaptive triggers that get stiffer or lighter depending on what's going on on screen, and the incredibly accurate vibration through those haptic feedback motors. Now, I think the best way to explain how this game handles those features is to show you the settings menu right here, simply titled DualSense, trademarked. Now, by default, this is on. I would recommend switching it to fire only because having increased tension on the left stick, which is just for aiming down sights, didn't really make sense to me. But I do want that realistic firearm trigger feel on the right trigger. Each gun has a different trigger feel, by the way. So I leave it on for firing only. Bow resistance, of course, leave that on. That's great to feel the resistance or tension as you knock an arrow and pull it back. And I have never seen this before, but it is very welcome, and I hope that game developers utilize this in the future. There are full toggle bars for each individual effect, such as melee or ambient weather. And this is a very useful one. If you want to turn it off for cinematics, because I'm somebody that sets down the controller a lot during cutscenes, and then it scares two driblets of piss out of me because it vibrates on my coffee table very loudly. So you can turn that off here. Although Sony did do a bunch of black magic trickery with the haptic feedback vibration, even during cutscenes. So there's some fun stuff to be had with your palms wrapped around the haunches of your controller. I still set it down a lot. I catch myself doing it all the time. Back to the screen. That's the wrong screen. What are you doing here? There it is. I will say, I think they overdid it with the haptics a little bit on the workbench. I wish there was a way in the settings to tone that down because it kind of felt like a big bowl of slop or soup in your hand. It was just constant vibration. It was a little bit overwhelming. I didn't like that. Uh, that was just on the workbench though. Everything else felt great. When you're sprinting, you feel each individual footstep. The bow not only gets stiffer as you pull it back, but it also linearly gets lighter as you let it out as well, which is cool because I've played a lot of other games that have the adaptive triggers and a bow for example, Horizon Forbidden West, and this seemed to make better use of the effect. It was awesome and totally added to the immersion. Would recommend. Five out of five. Now, at a quick glance, it might appear as if there's only two graphical modes, a performance, which targets a high frame rate, and then a graphical fidelity mode for the best looking graphics. If you pop on your gamer goggles and take a deeper look, you'll find that there's actually a combination of six different game modes by combining different combinations of the settings on screen here with this useful chart from Digital Foundry. Now, the mode that has my full backing is turning on the 120 hertz and VRR modes, and then putting the game into performance unlocked, which is going to get you that dynamic, meaning fluctuates in the background, 4K resolution mode targeting 60 or more frames per second. However, if your TV does not support VRR, variable refresh rate, or especially if it doesn't have an HDMI 2.1 port and you're not supporting 120 hertz gameplay, then I recommend keeping it in the performance mode because you're still getting dynamic 4K 60, which looks and plays phenomenally. If you want in-depth analysis of the technical performance of this game, I will have linked in the description below Digital Foundry's frame rate testing of this game in all six modes. However, in my playthrough, I kept it primarily in performance dynamic 4K mode, and I noticed zero frame rate stutter, and gameplay was incredibly fluid and smooth. When I switched it over to fidelity 4K mode, which made the graphics slightly better, and I do say slightly, it really wasn't that noticeable of a difference. The frame rate became noticeably more choppy at 30 frames per second. The point is, target 4K 60 gaming on the modern consoles if you can, or 1440, 120. That's nice as well. Now, I didn't experience any major bugs or glitches or anything. I did experience one weird little graphical glitch where during a death scene, Joel is getting killed by a clicker, but the clicker was invisible, so it just shows his neck being torn apart, but the character model for the enemy was invisible. It was just something that I chuckled about and it didn't ruin the game or anything. As for end game or replayability, actually pretty decent, which is surprising because the game does not include its original multiplayer. So you might be thinking to yourself, Kevin, what the hell kind of replayability does a game without multiplayer have? Collectibles? 
additional game modes, completionists, speed runs, and some random cool shit that I'm going to show you right now. Coming over here to the extras menu, once you beat the game at any difficulty level, these will all become unlocked. And as you can see, you have a ton of things such as concept art, an absolutely awesome 3D model viewer that you can spend a ton of time on, different skins and gear for Joel and Ellie, some very interesting cinematic filters. This one's kind of cool. It looks like Joel and Ellie are zombies. That would be virtually unplayable. That's kind of sick, but again, I don't know about the playability. And then starting with cool, they got a little bit lazy and these are all just a color filter. Boring. And then over here in gameplay modifiers, these are more or less just cheats that you can activate at any time. And some of these are real trippy. For example, you can mirror the entire game world. You can turn slow motion on and off on the fly or even turn on a one tap or invincibility mode. Maybe make the audio sound all janky. Sure, you can do it. As for the speed running community, because I looked it up and there is one around this game. Not huge, but there is a speed running community here and you have support, like a lot of support from the developers built in. You can also unlock some behind the scenes goodies if you're a diehard Last of Us fan. But because of the fact once you complete the game, you can play it on what is called gameplay plus mode that keeps all of your upgrades, your weapons, your attachments, your skill tree progression, etc. Plus you have those dank ass cheats or as they call them gameplay modifiers and those unique cinematic filters. Granted, I think you'll probably toggle them on and off. I don't foresee anybody really playing through the whole game like that. Because of that and the little point system that kind of incentivizes you to play through the game multiple times to unlock unlockables that you might be interested in. Replayability is actually decent with this title and I'm going to give it three out of five. I wish they did include the factions multiplayer mode, but what they did include is the left behind expansion pack, which is basically like a two hour campaign with Ellie and her lady comrade trapped inside of the mall. And I'm not going to spoil anything, but fun things happen at the mall. And that two hour DLC has of course been remastered as well. Rem remastered? No, remade. So is this game worth a pickup? Well, it depends. Are you a Last of Us fan? You probably are. If not, what the f what the hell are you doing here? You're in the wrong video. There's like playlists down there. There's controller videos. I got some PC videos over there. Gaming news is downtown. Now, in all seriousness, if you clicked on this video, you're most likely a Last of Us fan. And for a lot of gamers, unfortunately, this will be the third time that you've picked up this title. You bought it on the PS3, the remaster for the PS4, and now the remake for PS5. And if you got the deluxe or limited edition for each of those, Naughty Dog might have your rainy day money. Perhaps you're somebody like myself that enjoyed the title immensely when it first came out, but hasn't touched it in several years. In fact, I haven't played this title in about five years. I was due for another playthrough. I think the addition of accessibility features that'll make this game playable for gamers that might not have been able to use this game, play it previously, is awesome. I think the graphical modes, the fact that you have six of them versus the two that most games have is insane, but leaving it in that performance 4K mode looks damn good on the corneas to me. Graphics and audio design were fantastic. $70 is a lot of money to spend on a game that at its core has not changed. The story and gameplay are the same. However, if you were a big Last of us fan, just like if you're a big fan of Skyrim or Grand Theft Auto 5. You want to be able to play the game on its best possible platform, and the best possible platform as of now is the PlayStation 5, considering we're not going to get a PC port for quite some time. It has been confirmed by Sony that they are going to be porting over this title to PC as part of their initiative to port over a lot of their exclusive games, specifically around half of their library to PC and mobile phones by 2025, but we do not have a release date, even a vague season or quarter that we might be getting that. So in the meantime, the PlayStation 5 is by far the most powerful piece of hardware that you can play this title on. We've seen the gap even one generation from the PS4 to 5 is quite substantial. The PS5 is pushing around eight times the pixels per second. We'll use Stray, for example, a game that I reviewed on the channel recently. Even on the PS4 Pro, that game is sporting 1080p 30 frames per second. As we're on the PS5, it is 4K 60. Eight times the pixels per second over just last generation's hardware, even the midlife refresh, the PS4 Pro. Now, my final sentiment is that I do believe that if you have purchased this game and you do have it in your PlayStation library, like the PS4 version, that you could upgrade to this PS5 version. And while free would be awesome, I'm sure the developers over at Naughty Dog spent a lot of time and energy and resources creating this game, but $70? That is a little bit steep. You should be able to upgrade for $20, $40 at the most. In all honesty, I had a fantastic time playing through this game, but I want to hear your opinion. Drop it down there in the comment section below. We'll get a little forum going, a little conversation, and I will see you stallions and stallionettes tomorrow. If you enjoyed the video, liking it helps it to get seen by more gamers this information will reach in a system as well, which in turn helps me grow this little channel, which I do greatly appreciate. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover news in the gaming community and industry, tutorials helping you get set up streaming and YouTubing, as well as honest gaming product reviews, keyboards, mice, headsets, controllers, mics, chairs, etc. There are some hefty exclusive discount codes found only in the description of my videos and only for the audience here at Gamer Heaven. Check out Into the AM for some of the sickest looking and most comfortable cloth to ever grace my gaming giblets. 
If you don't want to be scorching your corneas with harmful blue light, check out Gamer Advantage, the only blue light glasses on the market that look sexy and actually work. If you're looking for a custom controller that'll blow the competition's tits back, AIM definitively has the best bang for buck or price to performance when it comes to Xbox, PlayStation, and Switch controllers. Nope, they don't do Switch, but they do do gaming mice. I said doo-doo. I have links to all my other platforms and socials in the description below. If you need a quick laugh or blast of gamer adrenaline, check my short form videos out at TikTok. To get in touch with myself and the stallions and stallionettes of gamer heaven join the community discord and check me out at twitch.tv where i go live every other leap year on a blue moon if it falls into an odd calendar number and my ph balance is on point just kidding starting june i'm going to be live streaming a lot thanks for watching this has been ak40 kevin hosting gamer heaven and i'll see you tomorrow because i upload daily all the time 60 percent of the time sometimes most of the time peace